Now we continue with the exposition of the Urga Sutta. And we come to verse number eight. So again, I'll recite each line in Pali, and then you recite after me. Yo nachasari, yo nachasari, napachasari, napachasari, sabang ajagama, sabang ajagama, imam papancham, imam papancham, so biku jahati, so biku jahati, o raparam, o raparam, urago. Jinamiva, Urago Jinamiva, Tachang Puranam, Tachang Puranam. Okay, so first I'll explain the first line. In the first line, we have two verbs which are set in opposition to each other. So the two verbs are. Actually, we have here nachasari. This is actually a conjunction of a negation, n, and the verb is achasari. I'm going to explain a little bit of Pali grammar here. <laughs> Don't get angry with me. <laughs> okay, the verb achasari is technically is called an aorist, which means a past tense of the verb. The actual present tense of the verb is atisarati, which has a prefix ati, which means, usually it indicates extreme, beyond, in excess, or superior, and then the verb sarati means to go or to run. And so if you know the refuges, like Budang Saranam, so that Saranam, the refuge, is based on the verb sarati, that to which one goes. Okay, and then this is the auris form. So ati sarati is to go too far. And then the opposite verb, pachasari, is also an aorist or past participle form based on the prefix pati. Plus sarati. Sarati again is to go, and pati has various uses, one of or various connotations. One of the connotations can be reverse, in reverse. And so, there are different ways to interpret this. Venerable Jnana Ponika, who translated this, said, one who neither goes too far nor lags behind. So I couldn't say pati sarati is meaning lags behind, but rather it's going back in the opposite direction. So I translated it as one who has neither run too far that's achasari, nor run back. That's pachasari. And the verse itself doesn't give a definitive way to interpret this opposition between going too far and going back, going in reverse. But this opposition seems in many ways to be an illustration of the Buddha's middle path. The Buddha's middle path is one of not going too far. In the case of the Buddha's practices, going too far would be engaging in those extreme austerities, the self-mortification. And then going back, <laughs> which he didn't do, <laughs> would have been giving up the ascetic life 
the renunciate life and going back to the palace to enjoy the pleasures, the worldly pleasures of, of the palace life. Okay, the commentary gives various explanations of going, to, running too far and running back, which indicates, because it gives various explanations, that the opposition doesn't have to be understood as having a single fixed meaning, but rather to be suggestive of various dichotomies that one has to avoid in following the middle way. So the commentary says, one runs too far when one falls into restlessness because of excess of energy, and one runs back when one falls into laziness or indolence because of excessive laxity. In fact, we see this opposition between the two in the case of, there was a monk who was named Sona, who was very delicate, his physical constitution was very delicate, and after he became ordained, he practiced very, very diligently, even doing walking meditation to the point where his, the soles of his feet started to break open and to bleed. But he wasn't able, though practicing very diligently, he couldn't reach any stages of distinction in his practice. And so he thought, ah, this monastic life is not for me, let me give it up and go back to the household life. And he came from a wealthy family, so he could have done, you know, used the wealth to do deeds of merit, as they say. And so he came to the Buddha and he said, Bhante, I've tried, it hasn't worked out, I'm going back. And the Buddha said to him, <laughs> before, when you were living the household life, didn't you play the veena? The veena is like the Indian lute. And he said, yes. And then the Buddha said, what happened when you would turn the strings, when you have the strings too loose? Could you get music out of it? And he said, you get sounds out of it, but it's not suitable for playing music. And then the Buddha said, what happens when you tie the strings too tight? Can you get music out of it? And again he said, you get some sounds out of it, but you don't get the right pitch and you might break a string. And so the Buddha said, it's exactly like that when you're doing the practice. If you strive too diligently with too much energy, then it's like tying the strings too tight. If you don't apply energy at all, and you become lazy, that's like having the strings too loose. So just like to play the lute, you have to get the string tied exactly right, the right pitch. So in your practice you have to balance energy and tranquility. And then you get the right degree of, the right balance of the faculties, and then you can progress. Okay, so another polarity or dichotomy in running too far and running back, the commentary says, this is by way of craving for existence and craving for sense pleasures. So craving for existence. Okay, so these two types of craving are set in opposition. Then the next contrast is by way of the eternalist view and the annihilationist view. It actually seems to me, I put a note here, but let me finish what the commentary says, then I'll come back. Okay, so we have this contrast, the eternalist view and the annihilationist view, then by way of sorrowing over the past and hoping for the future, then by way of views about regarding the past and views regarding the future. So having avoided both these extremes, practicing the middle way, one neither runs too far nor runs back. Then I had a note that it seems to me that in the last three explanations of the commentary, the two opposed terms should be inverted. That is the annihilationist view that goes too far, because the annihilationist 
in a way like the Buddha, doesn't accept a permanent self, but they go too far in that they proclaim that when the person dies, the person is completely annihilated and there's nothing, no continuation of consciousness beyond death. So that is going too far, whereas the eternalist proclaims that there is a permanent eternal self which goes on from life to life. And that is, in a sense, running back because there's an attachment to the idea of self. Okay, and I think it's obvious that the next pair, sorrowing over the past, seems to be running back, not running ahead. And then hoping for the future is running ahead. And then Similarly, views regarding the past seems to be running back and views regarding the future is go, are going too far. Okay, then I found a text, one text, which seems to provide one meaning, possible meaning of running too far and running back. This is from the, the suttas on dependent origination. So here it says that a noble disciple, when a noble disciple has clearly seen with correct wisdom this dependent origination and dependently arisen phenomena, it is impossible that he will run back into the past thinking, did I exist in the past, or didn't I exist in the past, or what was I in the past, how was I in, in the past, having been what, what did I become in the past. So that's running back. Then running forward into the future, he'll think, will I exist in the future, won't I exist in the future, what will I be in the future, how will I be in the future, having been what, what will I become in the future. So that's going too far or running forward into the future. And then the third, which doesn't come into the opposition, is that of being inwardly confused about the present, <laughs> thinking, <laughs> do I exist or don't I exist? <laughs> what am I? How am I? This being, where has it come from and where will it go? Okay, and the reason this is impossible is because the disciple has clearly seen dependent origination and dependently arisen phenomena. So the verbs here are a little different from the ones used in the Uruga Sutta, but they're very similar. <coughs> in this case, the verb for going too far is atidavati. So ati again is excess, and davit, the verb davati means to run, and then running back is pati davati, but davati and sarati, very similar in meaning. Okay, so we could take this verse, or, or this sutta, to illustrate one sense of running back of going too far and running back. Okay, then there's a sutta on the contrast between two kinds of views. And this sutta, I think, supports my contention that it is the annihilationist view which corresponds to going too far and the eternalist view, which corresponds to running back, or in this case, it's lagging behind. So the Sutta says that obsessed by two kinds of views, some lag behind, while others go too far. But those with eyes, so with, this is the eye of wisdom, see, see correctly. So how do some lag behind? Okay, and so most people delight in existence, take delight in existence, and rejoice in existence. And when the Dhamma, this is a delight in conditioned existence, and so when the Dhamma is being taught 
for the cessation of existence. This is for bhava niroda, which is the cessation of conditioned existence, the end of birth and death, nibbana. Then their minds do not launch out upon it, become placid by gaining confidence in it, settle down and resolve on it. So it's in this way that some lag behind, but then there are the others who go too far. And this is those who are repelled by existence, disgusted with existence. And they have this kind of emotional aversion towards existence. And so they delight in annihilation. Maybe we could think like some of the 1950s existentialist philosophers might fall into this category. So they delight in annihilation, thinking that when the self is annihilated with the breakup of the body after death and does not exist after death, that is peaceful, that is excellent, this is the way it should be. And that way some go too far. So, so this is those that, even though here it says that they affirm a self, but they're just taking the body to be the self. So it's just like, or the empirical personality. They don't affirm the Atman of the Upanishads, the ones who delight in existence. Well, that could be worldly people, ordinary people who believe in a permanent soul that will go to heaven after death and remain there forever. Or it can be like the thinkers of the Upanishads who would not be attracted to the, sens the sensual delights of a worldly, heavenly state, but they affirm the existence of the permanent, substantial Atman, the ground of personal being. And so from the Buddha standpoint, that is a subtle attachment to existence. And the annihilationists, though they're described here, they speak about a self, but that was the empirical personality, the body, and the mental functions. And they hold that these come into birth, come to birth out of nowhere, just through union of sperm and egg. And then we live our life, and then with the breakup of the body after death, nothing beyond that. And since they're repelled by existence, they extol this and say, that is peaceful, that is excellent. And then those who have eyes, the eye of insight, and can see correctly, they see that what has come to be as having come to be. So they see the conditioned origination, <coughs> dependent origination of phenomena. And having, having seen it thus, they practice for disenchantment with what has come to be, for its fading away and cessation. So in this way, those with eyes see. Okay, here is a sutta, this is actually the first sutta in the Sangyutta Nikaya, and I believe that the compilers of the text, when they compiled each of the Nikayas, the first, they put the a particular sutta in the position of first place for a particular reason, because they considered that sutta to be especially important. So at the beginning of the Diga Nikaya, they put the Brahmajala Sutta, which surveys the multitude of different views that were in circulation during the Buddha's time, the views that the Buddha rejected. In place of, in the first place in the Majjhima Nikaya, they put the discourse on the root, the Mula Pariyaya Sutta, which is very perplexing. I always say to people who want to read the Majjhima Nikaya, don't begin with Sutta number one, because you'll never understand it. <laughs> you have to read the other 151 suttas first, then at the end come back to the Mula Pariyaya Sutta. Then it starts, the meaning starts to come, to become clear. And I think in the Sangyutta Nikaya they put this sutta as in the first place, because in a way it sort of epitomizes very concisely 
the way in which the Buddha attained liberation. So here, deep in the middle of the night, a certain beautiful deity comes to the Buddha and asks, how did you cross the flood? This is a kind of metaphorical expression. The flood is the flood of samsara. <clears throat> and then the other shore of the flood, or maybe we could say that the near shore is samsara. The flood is the flood of the defilements and ignorance, and the far shore is nibbana. So the Buddha replies with something of a riddle. This is often when there's a dialogue between the Buddha and the deity, or the Buddha and the yaksha, it takes the form of a riddle. So the Buddha says, by not stopping and by not struggling, I cross the flood. So normally you think when a person is caught up in a flood, and the way that they're going to cross the flood, they have to struggle. But the Buddha says, it's by not stopping and by not struggling that I cross the flood. And then the deity is puzzled, and he, sa he asks the Buddha, how is it that you cross the flood by not stopping and not struggling? Then the Buddha said, when I came to a stop, then I sank. That means when the Buddha gave up his effort, if he gave up his effort, then he would sink. He wouldn't be able to make any progress, just fall away from the path. But when I struggled, that could be understood as applying excessive energy, and particularly in the case of the Buddha, as I said before, engaging in for six years in these tor tormenting, these afflictive, practices of self-mortification. So then I got swept away. Probably those kinds of practices just agitated the mind and didn't bring the concentration and tranquility needed to gain liberating wisdom. And so he says, then I got swept away. So that is how I crossed the flood, by not stopping and not struggling. This is another more philosophical sutta. Okay, we'll take it briefly. Actually, to explain it, it takes long explanation, but I'll just <coughs> do it rather concisely. Okay, so here the Buddha is speaking to a monk named Kachana, and he says, this world of people, for the most part, depend upon the duality, that is, upon the idea of existence. This would be eternalism, that there is a self that goes on existing eternally and that there's some kind of eternal ground or basis for the world. And the opposite is the notion of non-existence, the proclamation that there is no continu continuation beyond death and that's an effect the view of annihilation. Okay, but the Buddha goes on to say, for one who sees and understands the origin of the world as it really is with correct wisdom, there is no notion of non-existence in regard to the world. In other words, there's no notion of annihilation because one sees how our, our being consisting of the five aggregates comes into into existence or into being through dependent origination, or how the five aggregates that make us up originate through dependent origination. And so when one sees the origin of the world as it really is, then there's no notion of non-existence, of complete annihilation at death. Because one understands that as long as there is ignorance and craving, as there, there are ignorance and craving, 
at the time of death, then they will bring into being a new set of five aggregates and then a new world present to those five aggregates. And so with that, there's no notion of non-existence. And then for one who sees the cessation of the world as it really is with correct wisdom, there is no notion of existence in regard to the world. Which doesn't mean that the world doesn't really exist, but what it means that when one sees the breakup and perishing of all conditioned phenomena, including the five aggregates, including perception, mental activities, and consciousness, then there's no notion of a permanent eternal self that continues to exist forever. So then the Buddha goes on to say, this world for the most part is shackled by engagement, clinging, and adherence, but one who has right view does not become tied up in engagement and clinging in mental standpoints and so forth. He does not take a stand upon the idea, myself. He has no doubt that what arises is only dukkha arising. What ceases is only dukkha ceasing. Only conditioned phenomena are arising through causes and conditions. And what ceases, again, conditioned phenomena ceasing in dependence on the change in their conditions. So in this way, his knowledge is independent of others, and he has right view. Okay, so these are some ways to interpret neither running too far nor running back. The second line says that... Oh, actually... I didn't finish the sutta. So it just continues in a way, summing up, the Buddha says, to proclaim all exists, or the world exists substantially, this is one extreme. To proclaim all does not exist, that the person becomes annihilated at death, or that the world doesn't exist at all, this is the second extreme. So without veering towards either of these extremes, the Tathagata, the Buddha, teaches the Dhamma by the middle way, that is the middle way of dependent origination. Okay, so now we come to the second line. The second line is in the Pali, it's Sabang Achagamma Imam Papanchang. So the verb here is Achagamma. It's, it's, it's another aorist. This one is from ati, again, which means excessive or beyond, plus the verb gachati, which means to go. And so here it's going beyond in the sense of transcending. Here, ati has a positive sense. So one one has transcended all this proliferation. So we have two significant words here. One is sabban, which means all, and it's conjoined with papancha. The word papancha, I don't actually know the verbal derivation of it, but it's a word with very, I would say, a very, very pregnant meaning in Buddhism, in the early Buddhist texts. There's a Sri Lankan monk, very intelligent Sri Lankan monk, who wrote a small book about this term, Papancha. The monk's name is Bhikkhu Nyanananda, and the book he wrote is called Concept and Reality in Early Buddhism. And so he explains Papancha I think he was the one who used the word, introduced the word proliferation or conceptual proliferation as a rendering or papancha. We might also maybe use the word to render papancha fabrication, 
except that the Bhikkhu Tanisaro uses fabrication for Sankara. So if I were to use fabrication for Papancha, then people would get confused. So I prefer to stick. Actually, I, I've experimented one time using fabrication. But then, and I think actually fabrication is better for Papancha than for Sankara. But then I thought, if people read it, then they think either that I'm borrowing from Tanisaro, <laughs> but that I'm using it in a different way so people would get confused what is being referred to here. So I decided to stay with proliferation. Okay, so, yeah, so we take proliferation, or we could, in the discourse I'll use fabrication, as sort of the constructive or activity of the mind, the mind building upon the raw data of perception and building up its imaginary constructions based on the raw data. Maybe I'll give you a concrete illustration of this in my own experience, which is for me a sort of the decisive example of, or the definitive example of Papancha. This was in the year, first the background, at the time that I was living in Sri Lanka, so the last years that I was there, and staying in a place called the Forest Hermitage, and it was connected with another temple called Sena Nayakarama, they sort of functioned together. <laughs> there was one European monk who came to live at Sena Nayakarama, and then I had gone to Singapore, and this monk, even when I was at Forest Hermitage, he was a bit troublesome, like argumentative, boastful, aggressive towards the other monks. <laughs> okay, I had gone to Singapore in 2001 and the behavior of this monk was becoming more and more objectionable. He was a European monk. Okay, so the other monks had gotten together, they had repeatedly tried to speak to him, to tell him to change his ways, but he never changed and he just became more defensive of himself, more aggressive towards the others. So finally they consulted with like the head of that division of the order and he's the head of the order suggested then you just have to ask him to leave. <laughs> so they asked him to leave you know I was in Singapore at this point and then I was going back to the US and I was in the springtime I was to stop in Germany and to stay in Hamburg and I knew that this monk during the spring and early summer he would go back to Europe. Okay, when I was in Hamburg, I was invited to, this was Vesak time, the celebration of the Buddha's birth, enlightenment, nirvana. So I was invited to attend the Vesak celebration at the Hamburg Buddha Society. And so there was a woman, her name was Monika, who was, picked me up and drove me to the Hamburg Buddha Society. And when we got out of the car, you know, she looked across the street and I said, oh, it seems there's another monk, there's another monk there. And I looked and against the window, I saw him. <laughs> <laughs> and I saw him sort of turn and look at me and flash, it looked like a bitter smile. <laughs> and I'm crossing the street, agitated. <laughs> thinking in my mind, what's going to happen now? I wasn't, <laughs> he's going to accuse me of being the mastermind, the one who suggested to the other monks to get him thrown out from, from Sainanayaka Rama. <laughs> then he's going to scold me in front of the whole group. <laughs> and how am I going to defend myself? I'm imagining, I'm saying, I wasn't there, I was in Singapore. <laughs> Ah, but I knew. <laughs> I had my friends hacking your email account. <laughs> and I was thinking, should I turn to Monica and say, well, let's go back to your place. <laughs> you could tell them that um, I wasn't feeling well and decided not to go. But I thought, too late, too late. <laughs> so I'm building up all of these stories. Maybe he's going to punch me. Should I punch back? <laughs> OK, 
Okay, so then we get into the vestibule, like here, and I'm taking off my uh, slipper, my sandals, and the mind is going like 60 thoughts a second. Then we open the door into the hall, and I look around. There's no monk there. But there's a layman with short cropped hair <laughs> and wearing a kind of orange shirt who is sitting against the window. <laughs> and I just couldn't believe it. <laughs> that all along Monica had seen that man sitting against the window with the orange shirt and took that to be a monk. <laughs> and then based on that, my mind had developed a thousand stories of what's going to happen. All of those were papancha and mental fabrication. And now they all, in a split second, collapse. Okay, so coming back, getting more serious now. Okay, so the commentary, this is the commentary where we're explaining that proliferation consists in, actually it says, maybe more properly, it would be ideas sort of constructed through craving, conceit, and views, which originate from feeling, perception, and thought. So all of this the monk entirely transcends, he has entirely overcome it. <coughs> Okay, then there's a passage, a sutta passage, which explains how proliferation arises. This is an often quoted passage. And this is the monk named Mahakachana is speaking. So he says, dependent on the eye and visible forms, eye consciousness arises. So that is standard, the standard part of the process then the meeting of the three is contact. Then with contact as condition, feeling arises. Then what one feels, that one perceives. And so perceptions follows upon feeling. Then what one perceives, that one thinks about. One starts thinking about it in a kind of neutral way, just a purely objective way. But then, what happens if craving, conceit, and views infiltrate the thought process? Then what one is thinking about, that one proliferates. One starts building up ideas and notions of it based upon craving, conceit, and views. Or in the case, maybe in my case, it would be based upon fear or worry. So in that case, there was a perception. So looking through the window, I saw the orange shirt and close cropped <coughs> hair and the face with that smile. Then thinking about it, so I thought, ah, that's him. He's in Europe and somehow he got invited to this Vesak celebration. And then the proliferation took place. What's going to happen to me? What's he going to do? How am I going to deal with this? So all of that is Pro proliferation, and then what one proliferates on that account, ideas and notions born of proliferation, obsess a person in regard to visible forms, past, present, and future. Actually, I'll backtrack and say maybe, in my case, I proliferated by identifying the person that I saw with that monk, and then thinking back about the events that had taken place, that would be maybe the proliferation. Then when all of that worry and concern started to build up in my mind, those would be the ideas and notions born of proliferation, obsessing a person, in this case me, in regard to forms past, present, and future. And then the same thing is said in regard to the other sense faculties. Okay, then there is a sutta which speaks about, um, identifies different products of proliferation. So here the Buddha is saying that I am is a proliferation. So the, 
the guru proliferation is the concept asmi, I am. And then once the notion I am arises, and one takes it to be valid, then one has to start seeking an identity for I am. So one identifies it with something, so one thinks I am this. So in the case of the five aggregates, I'm form, feeling, perception, volitional activities, consciousness. Okay, then once one has the notion, I am this, then there comes the polarity or dichotomy of I shall be, that's the eternalist view, I shall not be, the annihilationist view. Then if one takes the, annihil the eternalist view, then there comes, I will consist of form, I will be formless, formless, I will be percipient, I'll be non-percipient, or neither percipient nor non-percipient. So those are different views about the afterlife that were current in the Buddha's time. And so then the, the text says, proliferation is a disease, a tumor, a dart, therefore you should train yourselves thus, we will dwell with a mind free of proliferation. Okay, so that takes us to verse number eight. Now we'll come to verse number nine. And as you'll see, the series of verses going from, actually starting from eight to through 13, are all built upon this, the first, uh, the same first line. So they're developing out of the polarity or dichotomy of not going too far or going backwards. Okay, so we read together. Yo nacha sari, yo nacha sari, na pacha sari, na pacha sari, sabang vita, sabang vita tang, sabang vita tang, idanti nyakva loke, idanti nyakva loke, so biku jahati oraparam. So bhikkhu jahati oraparam urago jinamiva urago jinamiva tachang puranam tachang puranam So the meaning here of translation one who has neither run too far nor run back having known about the world then I'm not happy with the translation but all this is unreal. That monk gives up the here and the beyond as a serpent sheds its old, worn-out skin. Okay, the operative term here, the term that I'm actually not happy with the rendering of, is, but I don't know what I'm trying to do. Vita tam. So that's what was rendered unreal, but Vita-tang is based upon Tat-tang, which has the sense of, sometimes it's used in the sense of simply saying such or thus, like thus is the way it is, such is the way it is. And so V has a, neg a ne negative import. So the V is negating tatta. So the sense is, this isn't the way it is. So it's not the way we, t things are not the way we take them to be. In other words, the appearance of things is deceptive. So when I render this, this is all unreal. It doesn't mean that the world doesn't really exist, that it's just the world itself is just an illusion, but rather that the, 
the way things appear is not the way things really are. And so the commentary, I think, for, well, first I took the word all, since it says that all is vitatam. All is not the way it actually is. Or all appears, the way all appears is not the way it actually is. So first I took the word all to take some texts which elaborate upon the notion of the all. So here is a very short sutta in, the Buddha, in which the Buddha says, I will teach you the all. So these are all things that have actual concrete existence. So what is the all? The eye and fullness, <coughs> ear and sounds, nose and odors, tongue and taste, the body and tactile objects, the mind and mental phenomena. So this is the all, I would say from the standpoint of insight contemplation in terms of our everyday dealings with the world. There are like many other things. There's people, processes, um, events, stories, histories, narratives. But all of that is built upon the foundation of the concrete phenomenal actualities so that when you look at them with the uh, everything that's going on with the mind of insight, what one sees are this eye and forms, ear and sounds and so forth, the mind and then the mental phenomena cognized by the mind. Okay, then the commentary explains the meaning of vitatam here and it says that this means devoid of a real nature. Again, it's tatta bhavam, which is just really saying the same thing. And then it says, what is meant is that it is unreal or not actual with respect to the way foolish people or ordinary worldly people take it to be because of the defilements that is, taking things to be permanent, permanent, pleasurable, beautiful, or taking things to be a self. And so this feeds into a sutta on, the Buddha speaks about four inversions. And the word inversions here The Pali word is vipalasa. Anyway, the stem of it means to throw. I don't know the actual verb. Asa means to throw. And then there's a prefix, pari, which means around. And then the v gives the idea of some kind of, in this case, some kind of distortion. So this is a distortion which comes from taking things, you could say, upside down. So it's an upside down type of understanding. In fact, that's literally the way the Chinese render vipalasa, vipariyasa, dian dao, inverted or upside down understanding. And so the text says that there are these four inversions which infect perception, our attitudes, the word here is citta, literally mind, and our views. And so the four are the inversion of perception, attitude, and view that takes the impermanent to be permanent. So we take things that are passing, that are transient, we hold to them, we see them as being permanent, or at least long enduring. And then we relate to them in our attitudes as if they're permanent. And then based on this way of thinking, we could even 
more philosophical types construct the view, this is permanent. And then the second inversion is taking things that are actually dukkha, unsatisfactory, um, flawed, defective, inadequate, taking the bound up with dissatisfaction and suffering, taking them to be pleasurable, to be fulfilling. And then there's the inversion of taking what is not self to be a self, and the inversion of taking what is unattractive in the sense, this is referring to the body, but is, when you look at it in terms of the constituent parts being not beautiful, taking it to be beautiful and attractive. So those are the four inversions, and then the four correct ways of seeing and understanding of seeing, relating through attitudes, and understanding through views, are taking the impermanent to be impermanent, taking what is dukkha to be dukkha, taking what is not-self to be not-self, and taking what is unattractive or not beautiful to be unattractive. And then, these inversions of perception, attitude, and view ultimately arise from abhija, from ignorance. And so here I take a sutta in which a monk comes to the Buddha. And asks, how should one know and see for ignorance to be abandoned and clear knowledge to arise? And then the Buddha says, when you know and see the I as impermanent, ignorance is abandoned and clear knowledge arises. And so with forms, I consciousness, I contact, and feeling. So this is the all. And so instead of taking the all through the inversions, it's being permanent, pleasurable, self, and beautiful, one begins by seeing the all as impermanent. And when one does so, then ignorance is abandoned and clear knowledge arises. Maybe this is just saying the same thing, so we'll go over to the next sutra. Okay, this is on the true and the false. This sutta occurs in the Sutta Nipata. Here the Buddha says, in this world, that which is regarded as true, the noble ones have seen it with correct wisdom. This is false. I think the two words here are satya, is truth, and musa, as in false speech, that is false. So that is one contemplation, and in that which the world takes to be false, this the noble ones have correctly seen, this is true. That's the second contemplation. And then the Buddha elaborates on this in verse. So he says, Behold the world together with its devas, conceiving a self in what is not self, <coughs> settled upon name and form. Name and form is the complex of the five aggregates. So they settle upon this and become attached to it. And then they conceive this is true. This is substantial. This is truly existent. This is myself or the container of myself. But then the text says, in whatever way they conceive it, it turns out otherwise. So this is its falsity, for what is transient and permanent is of a false or deceptive nature. And then the Buddha says, Nibbana is of a non-false nature, a non-deceptive nature. And this the Noble Ones know as truth, 
through the breakthrough or realization of truth, they are freed from the hunger of craving and they are fully quenched through the experience of Nibbana. <coughs> I'll ask whether there's any questions on anything that comes up in the discussion of these verses. Hi, my name is Sanya. Um, my name? Sanya. Sanya. Yes, yes. Um, I have a question relating... Wait, hold a moment. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Oh, pause. <laughs> okay. Maybe what? Maybe my question is why, because I guess I'm still thinking about my body yeah. as mine. But I guess my experience in meditation yesterday was feeling like I was, I was just confused, I guess, because I wasn't sure what the relationship yeah. was. Like, how do you not totally renounce your body? What is your relationship with this body that you're, you're taking care of, I guess? Yeah. Actually, uh, you, you bring up a, a very good point. And what I would say is that One could be applying the contemplation of non-self to the body prematurely without at, at a point where one has not yet had what I would call a full and appreciative sense of the body. So what I would say is that the basic exercises that come down, you see, too often I would say particularly in the modern world, we live too much detached from the body, in that we live very much in the world of our conceptions and you know, plans, engagements, activities, projections onto the future, recollections of the past. So we are not, our minds are not adequately anchored in our body. So I would say that many of the basic meditative practices in Buddhism, particularly from the standpoint of the Satipatthana system, help us to anchor our minds in our bodies and get a clearer sense of the body and more of a feeling of appreciation for the body and bodily experience. So for example, when one does mindfulness of breathing, almost for the first time one could start to realize that when it is actually breathing, it's not just a you know, idea in our mind, but we actually feel what goes on when we're breathing. And then as we attend to the body as breathing in and out, one feels the body at subtler and subtler levels. And then similarly, say, when doing the walking meditation, one really gets a sense of the mind becoming anchored in the body in its concrete immediacy. And then Part of the exercise in clear comprehension is comprehending what one is doing in each activity, like when going, returning, looking around, eating, experiencing the act of taking the food, putting it in the mouth, chewing, even going to the toilet. <laughs> so it's not something that one sort of puts out of one's mind by sitting on the toilet reading a magazine but one actually experiences the body going through the process of elimination. So this helps to sort of anchor our mind within our body and to experience very concretely and immediately the body and that helps us to gain an appreciation of the body. And particularly as I mentioned yesterday, the way the body does every, so much on its own without our having to interfere with it and control it. 
like an example that I came to mind yesterday is, you know, I got a cut, or what, if I shave and I get a cut, I don't have to, you know, maybe I'll just put a little disinfectant over it and then forget about it and the body on its own heals, heals itself. And I notice that you are pregnant. You don't have to think about nourishing the body, the, the baby, but the body has its own intelligence and does all of that on its own. Yeah, yeah. But you say that teaching on the contemplation of non-self, that is for eliminating the subtle attachment to the body that keeps us in bondage. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, and not identify. At one level, I think we should identify with the body, but not identifying in a way that involves this egotistic grasping or clinging. Bhante, uh, you mentioned uh, neither going too far and going too far, or too... Going back or running. Yeah, going back and to uh, kind of practice or try and see the fine, the fine point to just just right point of the yeah. way about clearly seeing the ten origination. And that kind of brings to mind to me, um, it brings to mind, you know, Biko Analyo from grasping to emptiness. And then what you mentioned before. Biko Analyo is what? Uh, from grasping to emptiness. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And what you mentioned before yesterday, like where we were discussing infancy, from infancy to adolescent cases, is that. Wait, I'm not hearing clearly. That a human in the human realm, yeah. from infancy, it does have the. The Buddha nature because it has, well, they have innate consciousness, yeah. which means that they have the Buddha nature to gain, yeah. uh, the, to, to attain the deathless dimension. But the question I, I have is how can uh, an infant, I guess, is that in theory or in practice, that an infant could come to clearly see the ten of origination? Or is it that they're so, they're so inundated by the proliferation? How can an infant see dependent origination? Yeah. Is that the question? Yeah. Uh, I don't think it would be possible for an, an infant to see dependent origination unless <laughs> that infant has a fully developed mind. But I think in almost all cases, it will take like years for the mind to develop to the point where one could understand dependent origination. Right, and I get that, but then I'm wondering then how do they have the Buddha nature to yeah. attain, you know, if, if they can attain, if every moment in the air yeah. now you can attain the deathless dimension, yeah. then how can an infant, how can we say they have the Buddha nature in yeah. the human realm to do that? <laughs> yeah, in, in the system that I'm familiar with, the system <coughs> from the early, early discourses, we don't have the idea of Buddha nature, but rather what one would say is that one has a potential to understand, but that potential depends upon, for it to be operative, to be functional, it would re require the development of the bodily organism, especially the brain, to develop to the point where these more sophisticated cognitive functions are possible. So maybe an infant at the age of what, two or three, mm -hmm. perhaps that person, that being, has like, practiced dharma and insight meditation in hundreds of past lives, and so they've even that they've de had insight into dependent origination. But at the age of two or three, the, that understanding would not yet be manifest. But maybe when they get to be one who develops quickly, maybe 12 or 13, then the brain will have developed enough for those operations to be possible. So the canon, there are a few cases in the text which speak about a novice, of seven years old, who became an ar <laughs> arahat. Yeah. Yeah. But I just have to wonder to myself, how is that really possible? <laughs> and sometimes, are they exaggerating? Yeah, it's a little embellishment. But it might be possible. But maybe seven is beyond the stage of infancy. Yeah. I guess it depends on like the lives, like the life they live, and 
no difference with parents and like soci the society they live in. Yeah. Like, like the child will be very influenced by that. So if they're surrounded by people who practice and who, like, who explain all of this, they might understand it much more earlier than someone who has no contact. Yeah, but I think it in infancy... I mean, not that young, but yeah. like seven or eight, because they... Oh, that would be possible, yeah. Especially this was a, a novice who became, or, or a person who at the age of seven became a novice monk. So they would have he maybe heard discourses on dependent origination from the Buddha or from the other, the elder monks. And if they had very sharp mind, then they perhaps could understand at the age of seven. Okay, um, Lynn, is that? Okay. Yeah, <laughs> We are. This retreat is specifically about the concept of delusion. Yeah, I actually gave the title to Spelling the Defilements and Delusions of the Mind. Okay. Yeah. All right. So, um, other defilements include hate and greed. <coughs> okay. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> not my fault, blame me. <laughs> blame JFK. Yeah. So I guess the three major barriers are, I'm very new to this, so uh, I'm not using correct um, vocabulary, but I understand the three major issues are hate, greed, and delusion, right. correct? Yeah. But a lot of what we have discussed and gone over also address both hate and greed as well. Yeah. So then are hate and greed part of delusion? sort of the biggest hindrance to enlightenment? Yeah. The texts speak about three unwholesome roots. Okay. Greed, hatred, and delusion. And so greed and hatred, we wouldn't say that they're part of delusion, but they're associated with delusion. And I would say probably of the three, delusion is the most fundamental of the three unwholesome roots. And then greed and hatred are rooted in delusion. Why would you say delusion is more fundamental than hate and greed? I'm actually going to come to the three unwholesome roots okay. in the next, I think it's in the next section. So I'll deal with them there. But do, but do you see sort of my question is like, it, is this retreat covering everything we need to know? <laughs> say it's at a pretty high level <laughs> because Bhante Sudaso and Giovanna told me that the retreat would be for those who have like previous ex retreat experience. Right. So it's not a sort of beginner's level retreat. Right. Yeah. Yeah, but I'll come to the three, what would be called the three roots. I think it's in the next section. Okay. Well, it, um, so daydreaming is a type of function. Daydreaming, daydreaming is a kind of uh, papancha. I would say papancha can take place in daydreaming. Yeah. So, is there anything in the sutras that teaches you how to turn off daydreaming? Because at the end, it's a kind of dukkha, right? It, it's a kind of uh, a kind of dukkha, daydreaming. Yes. Um, I'd say daydreaming occurs when one is not being mindful. And so the antidote to daydreaming is to be mindful of what is happening in the present. Or to direct the mind to something specific, so that one doesn't allow the mind just to drift. Is there a term that corresponds exactly to daydreaming? Maybe it would just be, there would be some term indicating the drifting of the mind. So one has to avoid the allowing the mind to drift and then bring the mind back to the present. And you Ian? Ian, yeah. yeah. Thank you. Um, 
So I, this kind of follows up uh, on Sonia's question um, about the, some of the difference between annihilationism and the middle mm -hmm. path yeah. of independent origination. Yeah. And I guess I'm specifically wondering, we've been speaking about um, people as being, you know, for convenience we use certain grammar, yeah. but that one who sees truly sees a, a, a collection of five aggregates. Yeah. And I wonder, and perhaps the answer is a simple physical answer, but yeah. what makes, what causes the individuation of those five aggregates into things that appear as people, if that mm. makes sense? The question makes sense. I don't know the answer to it. <laughs> <laughs> but we we'll say that the reason we say that the reason why people have like their individual characteristics, different physical features, psychological dispositions, tendencies, and so on, this is all coming through, I would say, habitual action from previous existences, from past lives, you know, flowing into the present. So that causes the differentiation of people. Mm -hmm. But if the question is intended, why are there different people, different living beings. You know, from the beginningless beginning, why are these dif why are they there are these differences? <laughs> I don't know the answer. <laughs> and I, I don't see that the answer has ever comes up in the text. Okay. Uh, so if each new life contains a new set of the five aggregates, yeah. does that then mean that the anusias and whatever karmic momentum we have is not contained in the five aggregates? Is something separate from the five aggregates? Or is it that the anusias and the karmic uh, force we've built up is part of the five aggregates, yeah. but that it forms the conditions yeah, for that's, the formation? Again, of that's an interesting question. <laughs> <laughs> and it's a question, I would say, the texts don't give a definite, or at least I can't find a definitive answer in the text. What I would say probably is that, from the standpoint of early Buddhism, that the anusias and karmic propensities exist as potentialities rather than as actualities. But this became like the problem that in the unfolding of Buddhism through the centuries, the Buddhist philosophers and thinkers confronted this problem as a philosophical problem and then tried to work out various <coughs> answers to it. Yeah, I think the, the Mahayana led to adding, um, instead of six kinds of consciousness, they, yeah. they added two more to include yeah, the exactly, yeah. and, and karmic tendencies. Yeah, yeah, th yeah, this was specifically the Yogacara school. Mm. Yeah, then they added the what they call the eighth consciousness, which is the Alaya Vijnana which is the storehouse consciousness, mm. which is supposed to store up the seeds of past karma and of the tendencies. And then the seventh consciousness, the mana, is supposed to be like the intermediary between the store consciousness and the six functional types of consciousness. But the other Buddhist schools always <coughs> recognize six types of consciousness. And so then, at a philosophical level, we have the problem of explaining where is the karma, where are the anusias and the other tendencies. So actually, if it's carried in, in mind consciousness, if it's carried in the yeah. mental yeah. formation, then yeah. uh, again, if we just take the dissolution of one yeah. being immediately followed by the formation yeah. of the next, yeah. Then yeah. there's not necessarily a problem there. Yeah, except that Okay, this would be any given consciousness has its particular object and its particular function. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so it seems that at the same time it would be difficult for it to preserve the anusias and the karmic uh, potentials. Mm -hmm. I guess I'm but, thinking, yeah. I'm thinking but, more but, sankara rather than the Excuse me? I'm thinking sankara and the five aggregates. If we include the anusyas under yeah. sankara, then, so like each moment has its sankara, 
which then is the basis for the arising of the sankaras in the next moment. So then we just have a continuous chain of each instant has its sankaras, which yeah. includes the anusyas, yeah. which then yeah. is the condition for the sankaras and anusyas in the next moment. Yeah. So then the death of the body in yeah. between is not yeah. an obstacle. Yeah, one could explain it that way. In fact, it's occurred to me that even though the, this isn't sort of in accordance with mainstream way of explanation, that every that vinyana as it flows on from one occasion of consciousness to another, underlying it, there is a deep layer of consciousness in which the karmic potentials and the tendencies is stored. So this would be functionally like the store consciousness, except that it's not posited as a distinct type of consciousness, but rather it could be taken as a stratum, a very deep stratum in every act of consciousness. Um, I've heard some scholars point to the second step of dependent origination, like Sankara um, Pachya Vinyana, that Vinyana, since it precedes sense consciousness, it would seem to precede the six sense consciousnesses. So then they posit Vinyana as the second step of dependent origination as that kind of underlying substrata of existence, that underlying... Wait, Vinyana is the second so, step um, in dependent origination? Um, second or third? Yeah, it's the third. Yeah. Third, yeah. The Vija Pachya Sankara, Sankara yeah. Pachya Vinyana, yeah. Vinyana Pachya Namadu, Namadu Pachya Salagetana. So, in that case, Vinyana precedes the six senses by two steps, and thus yeah. it precedes the six sense consciousnesses by two steps. Yeah. So then some people have posited that that is a, a more, uh, a deeper layer of consciousness mm -hmm. independent of the six senses. Is that what you're pointing to? Um, is that what you're suggesting? I'm not taking the vinyana dependent origination in that way. Yeah, this is just an idea that occurred to me, but I, I haven't tried to read it into the text. It's just sort of a philosophical way to explain this problem of where are the karmas, the karmic formations, and where are the anusyas. Okay, this will be the last question, and we'll have to go on to the next section. Okay. Please, is your name? Oh, my name is John. 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 Yeah. Um, this isn't directly related to what we just went over, but I just picked up on something, a little comment that you made in, in another answer to a question about the, the Satipatthana system. Yeah. And that uh, piqued my curiosity. Um, my, early, my first introduction to Theravada, as well as my second set of teachers, they really focused on the Satipatthana system. Um, there was Goenka and uh, Ajahn Jha. And you just said system. Maybe I should call it the method or the program. Um, let's say there are models, models. Like, okay, another model is that of what's sometimes called the graduated or success or sequential training that we find, for example, in Majjhima Nikaya, Sutta number 27 and number 51. And then a variant on that in Majjhima Nikaya Sutta number 39. So this is a sequence that begins with the arising of a Buddha in the world, then a person hears the Dhamma, gains faith, goes forth into the homeless life, then they undertake the bhikkhus training or way of life, which and then the different silas are enumerated, and then they develop and sequence qualities like restraint of the senses, um, contentment, clear comprehension in all activities, then the overcoming of the five hindrances. Or actually, next is going off into seclusion, then overcoming the five hindrances, then attaining in order the four jhanas, and then developing the three higher knowledges based on the four jhanas, culminating in liberation. Well, that's a lifetime model. Would the Satipatthana be used within? Yeah, one, one could see them sort of integrated or integrated.
intersecting. Yeah, though the 32 parts of the body is in the Satipatthana Sutta. That's where that's, yeah. yeah. But I just, yeah, I guess it's where I concentrate, do I concentrate upon the body or do I concentrate on concepts? And those things be like two different things. Yeah, you. the thing is like with, say, the meditation on the 32 parts of the body, it begins very conceptually mm-hmm. because one has to get a, ment- a fam- familiarity in one's mind with the 32 parts. But as one proceeds with it, it becomes more and more experiential. Yeah, well, I've found that uh, the sort of spontaneous arising of insight comes from like, a body meditation. Yes. Yeah. They're spark. They come yeah. from the conception. This isn't a question. I'll just leave it there. Because okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I want to proceed on to the next Please. verses. <laughs> Okay, these verses now, 10 to 13, form a set, a group. And what's interesting, I, I mentioned on the first day, this British monk in Malaysia, Bhikkhu Ananda Jyoti, he did this comparative study of the different versions of the Uraga Sutta, and he found that these verses exist only in the Pali version of the Uruga verses. They don't exist in the other three versions that he, that he consulted. So it seems like that these verses were added by compilers in the Pali tradition. And that they were not part of the original nucleus of the, of the verses. So what I'm going to do, it would be a lot to read all of these verses together. So we'll just read the first one of this set, number 10, and then I'll just go in and highlight the difference in each verse, and then we'll come into the discussion of them. So now we're doing verse number 10. Yo Natchasari Napachasari Napachasari Sabang vitatang. Sabang vitatang. Idanti vitalobo. Idanti vitalobo. So biku jahati. So biku jahati. Oraparam. Oraparam. Urago jinamiva. Urago jinamiva. Tachang puranam. Tachang puranam. And so the translation reads, one who has neither run too far nor run back, devoid of greed, knowing all this is unreal, the monk gives up the here and the beyond as a serpent sheds its old, worn-out skin. Okay, then verse 11 just substitutes for greed, it substitutes Vita Rago, devoid of lust. And actually in the suttas, greed and lust are used interchangeably as, as synonyms. So this seems almost like just an unnecessary elaboration. Okay, then the next verse has Vita Doso, which is devoid of hatred. And then the following verse, verse 13, 
as vita moho, devoid of delusion. So in effect, these four verses are highlighting the three unwholesome roots, greed, hatred, and delusion. Yeah, so the commentary tries to make a distinction between greed and lust. So it says here, greed is an all-inclusive designation for the first unwholesome root, or it signifies what's called unrighteous greed. That's the greed that transcends the bounds where it might be, in ordinary life, acceptable. And then lust is a specific designation for lust for the five objects of sensual pleasure. But as I said, in the suttas we often have, what sometimes the Buddha enumerates a text using lust, hatred and delusion. Other places he uses greed, hatred and delusion. So there doesn't seem to be a real significant difference between lust and greed. Even though in English they might have different connotations, but in Pali they seem to be indicating pretty much the same thing. Okay, so here is a passage which just speaks about the three unwholesome roots, calling them the three, I think the, the Pali word used is mala, which means stains. So there are these three stains, what are the three? The stain of lust, the stain of hatred, the stain of delusion. And then this Noble Eightfold Path is to be developed for direct knowledge of these three stains, for the full understanding of them, for their utter destruction, for their abandoning. Okay, then here's a well-known sutta in which the Buddha um, examines the three unwholesome roots. This is the Buddha's discourse to the Kalamas, often called the Kalama Sutta. So the Buddha asks them, when greed, hatred and delusion arise in you, is it for your welfare or for your harm? And they say, for our harm. And then a greedy person, overcome by greed, with mind obsessed by greed, destroys life, takes what is not given, transgresses with another's spouse and speaks falsehood. So greed becomes as a root, it's a, a blossom, so flowers in, or it manifests in unwholesome actions, in killing, stealing, sexual misconduct, false speech. So one engages in these oneself and then one encourages others to behave likewise. And so will that lead to harm and suffering for a long time? And they say, yes, Pante. Okay, and then the Buddha asks the same questions about one who's overcome by hatred, one but overcome by delusion. In each case, it will lead to their harm and suffering. So then the Buddha then continues, are these things wholesome or unwholesome? They're unwholesome, blameworthy or blameless, blameworthy, criticized by the wise, and if they're accepted and undertaken, they lead to harm and suffering. Okay, then here's a sutta where the a Brahmin approaches the Buddha and says to him that the stama, the teaching is said to be sanditiko, which means directly visible. And so he says, in what way is your teaching directly <coughs> visible, immediate, inviting one to come and see, applicable to be personally experienced by the wise? This is what we recite in the morning in Pali, Sanditiko, Akaliko, Ehipasiko, Opanayako, Pachatang, Vejitabo, Vinyuhi. Okay, then the Buddha now elaborates on first the dangers in lust. So he says, one excited by lust, overcome by lust, with mind obsessed by it, intends or acts for his own affliction, for the affliction of others, and for the affliction of both. And because of the obsession by lust, 
he experiences mental suffering and dejection. But when lust is abandoned, then he doesn't intend an act for his own affliction and so forth, and he does not experience mental suffering and dejection. So in this way, the teaching is directly visible. And the same is said about one who's obsessed by hatred, obsessed by delusion. And then these three unwholesome roots are also said to be the roots or causes for the creating of karma. And so this text explains that any karma, first the text says there are these three causes for the origination of karma. What are the three? Greed, hatred, and delusion. Then any karma fashioned through greed, born of greed, caused by greed, originated by greed, ripens wherever that the individual is reborn. And wherever that karma ripens, it is there that one experiences its result. And this can occur in any of three ways, either in this very life or in the next life, that is, after the next rebirth, or else on some subsequent occasion. Okay, and then the same thing is said about any karma created through hatred or karma created through delusion. And now of these three unwholesome roots, what is said, like this is using the Abhidhamma mode of analysis, that whenever greed is present, accompanying the greed is delusion. Like that's why I said that delusion is the most fundamental of the three. And it's because through delusion that one doesn't understand things as they really are. And so because one doesn't understand things, then one perceives things as being desirable, as being worth taking and acquiring for oneself. And so that is how delusion is sort of the underlying cause for greed. And then greed becomes the motivation for action. And so greed and delusion exist simultaneously. And also, delusion is the fundamental root for hatred. Like it's because we don't see other people as they really are in terms of non-self. And so when grasp on the notion that this is a person who is opposed to me, and in that way, hatred arises through delusion. And so delusion is the root, underlying root of hatred, and those two exist simultaneously. But it's said that greed and hatred, because they have opposite characteristics, don't exist simultaneously, though they can have a very intimate causal relationship between, between the two. So, for example, <laughs> as a young man, I'm very attracted to a young girl, and so there's a state of greed there, but then another guy comes and starts talking her up, and she smiles at him, and they laugh together, and I see them walking away, hand in hand. So even though I didn't know that guy before, but <laughs> 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 so if I passed them previously on the street, I had completely you know, neutral feeling towards him. But now when I see him, <laughs> hatred arises. <laughs> Maybe the delusion is that if I to, was to win that girl, then we would live happily ever after. And so that, that relationship would be beautiful and, ult and ultimately fulfilling. But isn't that greed too? 
Well, that is the greed. Well, well actually, no, 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 that is the delusion. But then from that delusion comes the desire to establish that relationship in the hope of reaching that ultimately, that ultimate fulfillment through the relationship. Okay. But then the guy you know, takes her over and then you know, the aversion arises towards that guy. So that's how greed could give rise to hatred. Okay, continuing the same story. <laughs> I guess I'm confused because did you say greed and hatred are opposites? In terms of their characteristics, they're okay. opposites, yes. Yeah. Because greed, the characteristic of greed is to get possession of something. Oh, gotcha. So okay. it's to pull something towards oneself. Right. And the characteristic of hatred is like aversion towards something, gotcha. which to push it away or to destroy it. Okay. Okay, so just to continue with this anecdote of how hatred now might give rise to greed. <laughs> okay, so suppose we're on the lunch line together and there's a plate with five cookies and guess who's behind me on the lunch line? <laughs> okay, so if that fellow is behind me on the lunch line, I see the plate with five cookies, and suddenly I have a craving for cookies. <laughs> and so I take five cookies. <laughs> so when he gets to the cookie platter, it'll be empty. <laughs> but then you suffer more than he does. I suffer more than he does. Too much sugar. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that is really the truth of the unwholesome roots. That's why the Buddha, the text says that greed leads to one's own affliction and to the affliction of others. could elaborate this and you know, one could, could find many exemplifications for this. Okay, the point that I wanted anyway to come to here is the way that karma ripens. So this becomes like a very fundamental principle in like all of the doctrinal systems or schools of, of Buddhism in explaining the ripening of karma. So karma, if it finds the opportunity it can ripen here and now in this very life. If it doesn't find the opportunity in this, in this present life, then it can ripen in the next life. And there's a significant number of karmas that we perform that take on the special function of generating rebirth into the next life. So that is one of the major functions of karma, is to produce the rebirth consciousness. This is called the Janaka karma, the productive or generative karma. And then that karma is what steers or directs the stream of consciousness to a particular realm of existence and into rebirth under particular conditions in that next existence. And then in the course of the next existence, other karmas can find the opportunity to ripen, and they can ripen in ways which will either reinforce the tendency of the rebirth consciousness. That is, if it's a good rebirth, they could produce more good results in the next life. That would be if it's a wholesome karma. And if it's a bad rebirth, or if it's a good rebirth, other negative unwholesome karma can ripen in forming obstructions to the good conditions of the next life. So, whenever, say, say I'm reborn under good conditions, 
and maybe I applied to college and through good karma from the previous life I'm able to get into the college that I want to. So that is sort of reinforcing the result of the previous, of the rebirth karma. But then I finish, or maybe when I'm in college, or it could also be through laziness. Let's not take that case. Okay, let's say I finish the college and I get out and I go seeking a job, but now there is obstructive karma from the previous life com now coming, becoming active. And that is preventing me, even though many opportunities might open up, but always somebody manages to get there first, to get the job, and so I meet problems getting the kind of job that I want. That could be happening through obstructive karma coming from the previous life. Okay, then there's karma that won't ripen in this life or in the next life, but this will ripen on some subsequent occasion, some life beyond the next one. And that type of karma, it said, remains as a potentiality through to the very end of our existence in samsara. The famous example given here is that of the Buddha's disciple Moggallana, who aeons ago in some previous life had committed the unwholesome karma of killing his own parents. And as a result of that, he was reborn in hell. Then after his life in hell, he went through many other existences until accumulating a lot of merits and building up paramis, till he became, in his last existence, the second chief disciple of the Buddha. The result of you know, tremendous merit and tremendous Paramis, but late in his life, late in the Buddha's life, he was assassinated by, they say, by some of the followers of the other sect, who were jealous of the Buddha, and they knew that Moggallana was a very eloquent preacher and exponent of the Buddha's teaching, and so they hired some assassins to kill Moggallana, and in that way he died. Actually, I wasn't intending to speak, to give a lecture on karma. Okay, but then the text goes on to speak about how when greed, hatred, and delusion are abandoned, the karma, or the making of karma, is cut off at the root, made like a palm stump, stump obliterated, so that it is no more subject to future arising, and then this is like seeds that are undamaged, not rotten, unspoiled by the wind and sun, capable of sprouting. And if a man were to burn them in fire and reduce them to ashes, and then winnow the ashes in a strong wind or let them be carried away by a stream, then those seeds would be destroyed, unable to spite, sprout, not liable to arise in the future. And so when, actually when greed, hatred, and delusion are abandoned, it's not the case that past karma is incapable of ripening in that last existence. So even the arhats, even the Buddha, experience the ripening of karma that they created in the past as long as they remain embodied. But it's when an enlightened one passes away into final nirvana, then the accumulated karmas now have no opportunity to ripen. Okay, so this takes us now through verse 13. So now I'll let, if anybody has any questions, then please feel welcome to us. Yeah. Your name again? Akash. Oh, you're Akash, that's right, yeah. Is there no mention of Paramita this Sutta? That's a very interesting point. It's something that I've been puzzled about. That there's no mention of Paramis or Paramitas in the four Nikayas. The place where Paramitas get mentioned is in a work that's included in the fifth Nikaya, the Kudaka Nikaya. The work is called the Buddha Vangsa, which is the story about how the being who has become the Buddha Gautama, many, many aeons ago, he was 
an ascetic he, or a young man named Sumedha who renounced the household life and became an ascetic. And then when he was meditating in seclusion, he came down into the town or city on alms round and he saw people were decorating the city and putting up pennants and banners and paving the road. And he wondered what's going on and he inquired and they told him that a Buddha has arisen in the world. This is the Buddha named Deepankara and he's coming to our city. And then Sumedha, when he heard the word Buddha, he was exhilarated and he asked if he could help prepare the way for the Buddha. And so he was helping to pave the road, to clear the road. And then just then the Buddha at the head of his order of monks came walking down the road and Sumedha, when he saw the Buddha, then he lay down on the mud asking the Buddha to walk over him. <laughs> but the Buddha walked around him. But when Sumedha saw the Buddha, then he formed in his mind the vow or aspiration, I wish to become a Buddha in the future. And then the Buddha Dipankara looked down at him and, said, and he read his mind and he knew what he was thinking and he knew his potentials. And so he said, in the future, after so many cosmic aeons, you will become a Buddha by the name of Gotama. And then Sumedha, when he got up, then he reflected, what do I have to do? What are the qualities that lead to Buddhahood? And then the Paramis came to mind, and he reflected on the Paramis. And then it said, in life after life, then he cultivated the Paramis. And it strikes me, as I said, is rather puzzling that there's no mention in the Nikayas the, the old Nikayas of the Paramis. And it seems almost to me that the Paramis, whether it's for Buddhahood or for attainment of Arhatship in some capacity, that they're necessary as the qualities that one has to develop. And so, even though they're not mentioned in the old Nikayas, but I see them as essential parts of the practice, as sort of the... I compare them to like a rocket ship to take off and to break the gravitational field of the Earth has... Are there any rocket scientists here? <laughs> okay, so if I make a statement that it's not completely accurate, I won't be criticized. That it, that it has a base part and then the upper part, which is the part which will actually go into outer space. And so the base part is what contains the fuel. And when the rocket is taking off, it burns the fuel in the lower part, and then it, both parts together take off and head off to break the gravitational field of the Earth. And then at a certain point, when it, the rocket is out of the gravitational field, then the lower part drops off and falls and then just burns up in the atmosphere or it falls into the ocean and then the rocket continues until it reaches the moon or some other planet out of space. So the way I see it, the paramis are like the base of the rocket ship. They're, the, or the, they're like the fuel in that base and the upper part of the rocket ship is like the 37 aids to enlightenment, you know, the four foundations of mindfulness, the five faculties, the seven, <laughs> seven factors of enlightenment. So it's the paramis that sort of build up the foundation of practice and propel us upwards. And then it's the, say, seven factors of enlightenment that bring us to enlightenment. So there's, it's not the, quite the, the case that there's completely separate, since it's when one is practicing, say, the four foundations of mindfulness, or the five, developing the five faculties, one is also building up the paramis. And to build up the paramis, one also has to practice, you know, the 37 A's to enlightenment. But we can make a conceptual distinction between the two, that the paramis are sort of the accumulations of wholesome qualities that support and sustain us in our efforts. And it's the other factors that direct us 
bring us closer to the goal. I just wanted to follow up because I'm confused now. Are the paramis a Mahayana concept? Not completely. In fact, the paramis, seem, the idea of paramis arose, or paramitas arose, probably they arose in the Theravada school before the arising of Mahayana, and they also arose in the, some of the other early schools before the rise of Mahayana. So in the Mahayana, in taking the paramitas as being the essential qualities for a bodhisattva to practice, um, they were building upon a concept that already had arisen in the mainstream Buddhist schools, the pre-Mahayana schools. Um, what seems to be a somewhat later development, you see, when the paramis are introduced in the Buddha Bhangsa, they are the qualities that a bodhisattva aspirant has to practice in order to reach Buddhahood. But as the Theravada understanding of the paramis unfolded, they came to be seen as the kind of qualities that anybody has to practice, that we like, all have to practice, not necessarily for Buddhahood, but for the attainment of whether it's arhatship, Pacheka Buddhahood, or Buddhahood. So they become the essential sort of supporting qualities for any higher attainment. And what, what differs is the extent to which the paramis are to be practiced and the the magnitude of the paramis. So they're most abundant or highest for supreme Buddhahood then, and to be practiced over the longest period for supreme Buddhahood, then to a lesser extent to become a Pacheka Buddha and to a lesser extent to become an Arhat. And then there are different gradations according to the level of Arhat, whether it's as a chief disciple of the Buddha, then to the greatest extent, as one of the great disciples, to a lesser extent, to a direct disciple, to a lesser extent, and so on. Bhante, I have a question. Yeah. Um, I have a question, but the question is not entirely formulated, so yeah. it's sort of like a, a jump to a question. Yeah, so anyway. So just work with me here. Um, <laughs> just work? Work with me here. Okay. <laughs> so to become enlightened, we have to cut off the unwholesome roots. We cut off the unwholesome roots by you know, building the fence of morality conduct, establish the condition for yeah. samadhi, yeah. and then clearly see the four noble truths. Yeah. To do that, we have to take it step by step, step by step, yeah. by eliminating unwholesome roots each moment, each moment. But how do we, when we notice that there are certain views that we have when we're conceptualizing the Dhamma, when we're conceptualizing the Buddhist teaching, and we see any aspect that, some kind of subtle aspect that is a discrepancy and it's not a firm, concrete, authoritative yes or no, how do we know, how, how does that not put our practice sort of like at a, at a ceiling? How do, we, <laughs> how do we go past that in our practice and then keep going? Or is it that to see clearly it's not really the conceptualization so much or the examination of the teachings, but to get a, a concrete understanding of what it's about and then work through that, like in the territory, if I'm making myself clear? Like the teachings of the roadmap and then the territory is when we're practicing? Say, say the last sentence again. I said the territory is when we're practicing. <laughs> What did he say just before that? Yeah, basically I just don't know. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. I think I think I understand the point. Let me see if I could if I could rephrase the point. Please, that please. As you're practicing, you meet certain areas of conceptual unclarity mm -hmm. where you can't like make out some aspect of the teaching clearly. Right. Um And that seems to be like something like a hindrance to, to your practice. Yeah, progressing. Yeah. <laughs> okay. If it's like unclarity about things that are really directly related to the practice, 
then you could either consult with a monk who knows, that you would come to one of Bhante Sudaso's classes in New York, then you could ask the question, or you, if it's like a particular point, if you have like the Nikaya translations, you look at the index to see if that point is dealt with there, or just go on reading, you know, trying to find suttas that will clear up that point. Um, so that, those are like areas of unclarity that relate to your practice. If it's like unclarity about theoretical matters, of course, again, you could ask or like consult the text. But I say, when it comes to theoretical matters, don't be too worried, but just continue. As long as you find a clear way to maintain your practice, then just continue with the practice with the confidence that as your practice advances, then those, and as your, especially as your reading and study continues, those areas of conceptual or theoretical unclarity will clear up. So the main thing to be concerned with are areas of unclarity, unclarity about how to continue with the practice. Mm -hmm. and put theoretical and purely doctrinal matters sort of yeah. on the back burner. Yeah. Okay. Your name again? Dragor. 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 Uh -huh. oh, okay. This is somewhat theoretical, but I feel it pertains to my yeah. practice. Um, is fear a defilement? And if so, which one? Yeah, this is an interesting point. That of fear, it's often mentioned in the text, though it's not classified amongst the defilements. But there, there are several suttas which speak about how fear arises through clinging. <laughs> so I would say that fear maybe is an aspect of dukkha rather than of the defilements. Mm -hmm. So it's a result rather than a cause? It's a result of the, def or it's a consequence of the defilements, particularly clinging, mm -hmm. and it belongs on the side of dukkha rather than on the side of the defilements. It's a kind of aspect of dukkha. What is the distinction between the defilement and dukkha? Okay, the defilements are unwholesome mental states which motivate unwholesome action. And in a sense, you could say that there's also dukkha immediately connected to the defilements. But we say that the dukkha is the experience, say, of distress and affliction and <coughs> tension and in some cases fear uh -huh. that arise on account of the defilements. Yeah, so the, the, we say that dukkha is closely bound up with the defilements, but the defilement is that unwholesome mental state that obsesses the mind, that afflicts the mind, and that can motivate unwholesome action. So Whereas dukkha is the unsatisfied feeling of dissatisfaction or of distress that arises on account of those states. So dukkha is not necessarily itself a defilement. It doesn't necessarily... No, dukkha itself is not the defilement. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, I, this is more of a theoretical, like, theoretical question I have to relate to Kanda. Um, I find it like dukkha not maybe like conversion within myself, like reading like the sutras and you know, there's like the, that talks about the hell realms and yeah. the different sufferings in there, right? Yeah. So like, and then maybe you can like shed some light and maybe how sh I should open up my like mind to kind of accept it. Because like, uh, like the story you just mentioned about the monk, how he killed his parents in one life. Yeah. So I think I heard that, like I read that story too, yeah. and then because of that, like when his karma red ripens, he got descended to the hell realm where they're like suffered for a long time. Yeah. So I'm just thinking, in the human realm, when you have a criminal like that, who because of like you know deluded mind, and there's a the
great internal suffering within self, you know, yeah. and he, uh, he acted and he murdered his parents. Yeah. But it really drew out, like, you know, uh, caused like delusion in his mind that he did not know better at that particular point, so he did that, yeah. right? But in the human world, when someone like that gets sentenced to court, and if he really regrets and remorse for it and realize, oh my God, I did this, this is yeah. horrible, I really feel guilty and shameful, it. and then, you know, usually a jury, like, gives them, um, like, usually will try to give them a chance to relive, like, their life, like, you know, maybe you're sentenced to, like, life in presence. Yeah. But then, like, in the, the theoretical karmic, like, um, theory, I find it, like, very, very harsh. It's like, because in the human form, you can, can uh, you know, conduct these like harmful actions to others. Yeah. You just really at that time didn't know better. Yeah. And then when the karma ripens, you get kind of, of course, there's like corresponding consciousness in yes. order for you to like manifest, right? But then I just think it's really harsh. Like, even in the human realm, we'll say. I think you have to put the question precisely. It's like, it's like, <laughs> it's like why is it so hard? Because even in the human mind, it's yeah. like, we will give this person another chance, not just like yeah. say, kill yeah. him off. Yeah. But then when the karma ripens, yeah. it's to me it's just so so harsh. Like yeah. it gets like kind of drive and not drive, but you know, the hell methods and yeah. he's in there suffer for just like one action that he did because he no <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> I, mean, I think I it's yeah, but that's just the way it is. <laughs> I didn't make it up. <laughs> I'm not the one who, who wrote the laws of karma. <laughs> it's, it's yeah, there are these actions which are said to to be so serious, so grave that they bring the rebirth into this realm of intense suffering. And so, I guess it's, it's not that the Buddha himself also writes the laws of karma, but he just, with his enlightened mind, he sort of reads the, the, the laws, and he explains, like, this is the way it works. So... Yeah, it's very disturbing. <laughs> um, but just as I said, like that's the explanation of the way the the karma operates. Can, can I just ask, like, when he brought up a point, like, is it a metaphor? Yeah. I mean, you know, like that's an interesting point. To yeah, I don't think the texts take it as a metaphor. Since often they use the expression about somebody who commits extremely, you know, uh, unwholesome actions with the breakup of the body after death, is reborn in hell, or somebody who does good, is exceptionally good deeds with the breakup of the body after death, he is reborn in the heavenly world. Okay, we'll just make one more point, then I think we have to start the work period. Okay. Um, I hope that doesn't sound. <laughs> I'm, treating too, no, I'm treating the question too superficially. But it, it's sort of a, a follow-up. Um, this is something that's been, I'm pretty clear on it now, but there's no concept of grace in Buddhism. There's no power that can relieve you of the consequences of your actions in Buddhism. What I would say is that maybe what corresponds to grace would be some accumulation of wholesome karma that one is not aware of, that finds the opportunity to ripen, maybe in times when one is in trouble, when it sort of opens a theory that helps one to get out of the experience. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
the, the, the plane's going over here, very close then. No, I think it's just blue. <laughs> in the sense of some divine power that extends down to one. But also there are, I would say, behind the scenes that there are devas who are sort of looking down that help us from time to time. But we're not aware of it, we don't see them, but somehow they pull the strings to help us. So there are beings more powerful than us in human form yeah, that yeah, can yeah. That help could us help, yeah. and do us favors. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But we have to earn their favor through our own meritorious deeds. Okay, I think we have to break now for the work period, the lunch preparation.